I think so. Trey's going to take us on a, a tour behind the scenes of, uh, of the lab, kind of going to show you what goes on behind the closed doors. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I, you know, it's nice, nice being here. You know, it, it it's probably sounds like a dry subject at first, but I guarantee you there's going to be at least four or five board questions by the end of this that you will get by listening to this and also you'll be able to um you know send in the correct specimens and the correct fi fixatives for what answers you want etc so let's go ahead and start so uh first you know we'll, we'll just run through it just like a, a, a specimen comes into the lab and the first is you know specimens get accessioned when they come in and you know sometimes you'll see it. i've had multiple phone calls asking about this little white thing here in the specimen package that that comes from Sages and actually that's a formal and absorber and um, the the FDA and health and human services are now recommending this in all bags and whatnot so we're completely compliant with that and that's what that little thing is but it's completely non-toxic if, if, if you all see that so um, you know the first is an, uh, after an, a specimen is accession and gets a number it gets grossed in and you know this is kind of the basics but you know um, um, you know, ellipses get get sectioned, bread loafed into tips. If they're oriented, you can orient them with a with a suture, and then we can give you exactly what margin is positive. Um, um, or things can be done via you know on foss margins, where we gross it in such that these margins are placed in on foss, and you're seeing the whole thing. Uh, you know, I bring I bring this up a little bit because when when you're doing a bread loaf specimen such as this while you lose some of the margins right in these regions, you gain the information of seeing the actual lesion as it trails off. And you can see lesion to normal to negative margin. When you do on FOSS margins, you don't get the benefit of seeing lesion to negative to normal margin. Instead, you just see margin. So if you're looking for a melanoma that's, that's composed of all single melanocytes and is trailing off at the junction, you know, it's very difficult to know if you're running into a little lentiginous junctional nevus at this margin here or when you're doing it on FOSS, whereas if you bread loaf it like this, you can easily see where the lesion actually stops and the new, you know, a new nevus that you're running into begins. So I just wanted to bring that up, you know, as everything in life, the, you know, you gain some things by doing it on FOSS, i.e. you're seeing all the margins, but you lose seeing the lesion. So, um, so the step one is you when you all do the biopsy you put it into a bottle and, and that bottle contains a fixative and and basically when what you're doing is you're taking the tissue and you're stabilizing uh you're stabilizing the proteins by by cross-leaking lysine residues and it essentially chemically cooks it just like you do you can heat uh cross-leak um lysine residues by microwaving an egg or you could fix it but essentially you turn it you turn a raw egg into a cooked egg and you turn raw tissue into cooked tissue uh, chemically and you can do al you can do this with aldehydes which is formalin and i'm going to say some of these things because you'll you'll run into these terms and 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 you'll know what they are you don't need to know them by heart right now or for the boards or anything but you, you may hear some of these so you can fix with aldehydes which is formalin the most common or glutaraldehyde, you'll see that if you're doing electron microscopy, which not many people do anymore because immunostains have, have made that obsolete, but you can you can fix with mercury, and those are B5 and zincers, and oftentimes in hematopathology, they use those for fixatives. Um, Buens is a, is a pick rate, and, and that's not used very often. It, it makes beautiful slides, but it's also when it dries, it's highly explosive, so <laughs> just I, I was working in a lab one time and they let the Bowen's fixative dry and and it sat in a cabinet for like two years dried and then they discovered it and they had to have a bomb squad come in and take it away so you know you got to be careful and then you can fix with alcohol ethanol or carnoy solution and you can oxidize with osmium uh, tetroxide or permanganates but really let's focus on the formalin but things that affect fixation and that are ultimately going to affect the tissue are the time interval. So the quicker the tissue gets into the fixative, the better preservation. So the minute you take it out of the body, it starts to rot because it becomes anoxic and the cells start to die. So the faster you can get it into the formalin, the better the cellular detail is preserved. And you also need to buffer formalin. 
And this is very important because of some of the artifacts that we get later. And, and you basically buffer it to pH 6.8 because if you, if, if you don't, then you get heme pigment, um, a formal and heme precipitate occurs and, and, and um, you get a, a pigment deposition. Uh, things that affect also are penetration. So formula and alcohol penetrate the best out of all those fixative and glutaraldehyde the worst, but, um, and you need a, a, a high volume to tissue ratio. So it should op optimally be, should be 10 to 20 to one ratio. You know, every once in a while we'll see a lipoma stuffed in, in a jar and, 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 you know, there's essentially no formal in it. It's all just lipoma, you know, and that's actually the worst case scenario because lipoma is, uh, you know, fat, formalin is a water-based um, fixative and it doesn't penetrate fat well. So you really have to have a lot. Um, and then, um, so things to think about, but we talked about the, the buffering and whatnot. I'm going to skip through some of these. So, so main things about formalin fixation is it doesn't affect the structure of proteins. So we can do immunostains on it. Okay. So that's, that's a big deal. Um, also, formalin can be used uh, for, or, or excuse me, it can be used for these immunostains, but you can't do immunofluorescence on formalin fixed tissue. All right. So, take home. If you're going to do direct immunofluorescence, and we'll talk about this more, sorry, that's misspelled there. We'll talk about it more later, but um, you need to use a preservative solution, which is Michelle's. And Michelle's is not a fixative, but it's a transport. Okay, and, and you can either, you'll see it as Michelle's or Zeus. You can use Zeus also. And it's a basically a phosphate buffered saline solution that has a few other things in it to, to basically preserve the tissue. And for direct immunofluorescence, the faster you get it to the lab, the better. You can do it and you can get it to us just in saline if it were down the hall. That's the best, actually. You just bring it on the saline soap gauze if, if your lab happens to be down the hall, and then we immediately freeze it. Uh, but but if not, you need to put it in, into Michelle's and you usually want to get it here within 48 hours or so. Uh, glutaraldehyde, we're not going to talk about that. Um, we're just going to skip through some of this because it's not relevant and it's not going to be on your board. So the, the second step is after we've received it and we've grossed it, then it goes through tissue processing. Okay. And what we're essentially doing is uh, formalin is a water base. So when it arrives to the lab, it's basically a water soluble tissue. Okay. But what we want to do is eventually we want to put this tissue into paraffin so we can cut it. And the only way that you can get water into paraffin is to remove the water, right? So we need to remove the water from the tissue. And that's essentially what we're doing when we're processing it. And we, we basically take it through a series of progressively increasing concentrations of alcohol that draws out the water by diffusion. Okay. So that's what, that's what processing is. So then what we're left with is an alcohol impregnated um, uh, tissue. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to get the tissue impregnated with some substance that's both slightly water soluble for the, for the alcohol and the tissue. And then also we want it to be slightly paraffin soluble and that we use xylene. So now that we have now all alcohol soaked tissue, we now impregnate it with xylene. And then once it's now xylenized, if you will, we then in infiltrate it with paraffin. And we do that under heat and pressure. So um, we both, we, we use a, a, a vacuum actually. Using a vacuum, we apply it to the tissue. We then pump in a uh, heated paraffin and we let it kind of sit there for a while at a certain temperature. And these are the machines that do it. So it's an the, there, you could do all that by hand, but, but we, we now do it with an automated uh, tissue processor and he, the tissue goes into here and the various solutions are at different concentrations here and they get pumped into this chamber. And then eventually, so eventually progressively concentrated alcohol solutions get pumped in and then xylene and then finally the paraffin under a vacuum and some slight heat. And at the end of that, you come out with paraffin embedded cooked tissue. And it's very hard, actually. Um, it, it's, it's infectious even before it goes into here. Some, formalin doesn't kill everything, 
Um, it kills most things, but it's still considered infectious. Once it comes out of here, it's no longer infectious with the exception of prions. Prions can survive processing, but nothing else does. After it comes off the processor, um, we, we have to embed it in even more wax. So now we have just a chunk of tissue that's, that's kind of like, almost like a, um, a candle wick, if you will. You know, it's got wax on it, but we still can't really cut it. So we, we embed it, we orient it properly so that the sections are gonna be just right. And we also impregnate it with even more paraffin. And we do this on an embedding machine. And essentially, this is a schematic of it. You have a wax reservoir here. You have a wax dispenser. It literally just shoots wax out right here. You've got a warm, this plate is warm and this plate is cold. And we, we take our cassettes out with the tissue. We put them in here. So we take our cassettes out of these holes right here, which you can see that these have all the, the wax embedded tissue. We take them out, we open them up. We literally pour wax on the top of them in these little in these little metal containers right here, and let it let it then cool and harden on this cold plate. So hot right here, so we can orient it and get it just right, and then we then we let get it cold so that it hardens. And this is kind of a schematic. And what you end up with is this right here. So you've got the tissue embedded right here in the paraffin. And then we have to section it. So the tissue's in its paraffin block and we, and we place it on a microtome, essentially, which is, which is this machine right here. It goes onto this block, that cassette goes onto this block, and here's a blade right here. This thing, this goes up and down vertically and also comes, comes forward five microns or two microns, depending on however you want to section it. So basically you get this and you get a ribbon of sections, which you then, take that ribbon of sections and you put it on water, which is kind of uh, at, at a certain temperature. And then you literally take the slide under it and scoop it up. After you've scooped that onto the slide, now we have paraffin embedded tissue that is hydrophobic, right? It doesn't like water, but guess what? Hematoxin and eosin are hydrophilic. So we basically removed the water from the tissue so that we could get it into wax so that we could cut it really thin. Now we want to remove the wax so that we can stain it. Because if you try to stain paraffin embedded tissue, absolutely nothing happens. The, the hematoxylin isn't just roll right off it. So the first step in deparaffinizing is to put it into an oven. All right, so we put it into an oven which melts the wax and actually evaporates some of it. And then, then we do the reverse. We, we, we put it, it you know, we, we, we go, from high concentration of alcohol to lower concentration of alcohol and, and, and remove the paraffin with the alcohol and then increase the water content. So we basically do the opposite of the processing. And here we have in our lab, we have automated stainers that they just basically, you put the tissue in and racks and it goes through. It, it has a robot, robotic arm that does it and then it pops out and it actually has a automatic um, cover slipper right there too. So what is hematoxin? So hematoxin was originally obtained. It was an oxidized product of a logwood tree known as hematin. And then, um, uh, uh, you know, now it's, it's, still, it's still manufactured from that same wood, but, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a little more complicated now. But, but it's a basic dye and it, it stains nucleic acids basically blue. So it's going to stain nuclei blue, essentially. The other stain we use is eosinophen, or excuse me, eosin, and it, that's an acidic dye with an affinity for cytoplasmic components. So eosin is much more forgiving, less of a problem in the lab. It's, you have to be very ginger with the, with the hematoxylin to get it just right. With eosin, you just kind of dump it in and it's fine, but you can overstain it, but it's usually not a problem because there are two types of stains, and you're going to hear about these in a and, and a, a, um, a regressive stain is where you basically overstain it with he, hematoxylin and eosin, both of them. And then, then you, you use acid alcohol to remove the overstaining. And what that does is it's much, it's much more forgiving because you basically just overstain everything and then you de-stain it to the point you want it. And it's that de-staining step that's very important. 
but not only that it gives you extreme it gives you this great it gives you a pop to the to the eosin and, and hematoxylin color and a progressive stain you don't overstain it you just depending on how long you keep it in the hematoxylin and the eosin um, depends on your stain so you can by hand you can do a progressive stain but when you're doing batch staining and automatic stainers everyone uses a regressive stain cover slipping you have to cover slip it just for the optics. It both, it both preserves the slide and, and it makes it optically readable um, when, when, when we're uh, looking at the slides. Artifacts, let's talk about some artifacts. So we talked a little bit about the precipitate with, um, if you, if you have a, a little precipitate that's all over, that's usually the formalin heme pigment that we were talking about before. That's why we buffer formalin, but sometimes the buffering doesn't work correctly, or if there's a lot of blood in the specimen, the buffer gets all used up. But um, um, that's one artifact, and and actually that 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 is a polarizable phenomenon, so you can actually see it. And and here it is, and you will see this this pigment right here. This is the this is not melanin or anything. And if you polarize it, so we take polarizing film, you can see that. That, that pigment is polarizing, and that's very characteristic of just formalin precipitate with heme. Other things that you might see, tissues that are in, insufficiently dehydrated prior to the clearing uh, with the paraffin wax, you can't section them with the microtome. They're very difficult to section, so you get tearing and holes, um, um, et cetera. And you can have water contamination in your alcohol. Remember, we're using alcohol to draw out the water and if, if your alcohol is contaminated with too much water from the tissues that it's drawn out, meaning the tissues have overwhelmed the alcohol, you get awful um, uh, uh, processing, which is very hard to fix. And then, so you, you need to be very careful about maintaining your alcohol concentrates. And then you can get bubbles under cover slips, et cetera. So let's move on to some special stains. So uh, one, so we're moving on from processing and whatnot to staining, and this this is going to be more some of your board stuff. But th that that's a basics of a, a lab, how they work and whatnot. And if you all ever open up some of your own labs, you know you'll be getting into much more of this in detail. But but that that's your basics. So so um, some special stains. So you know when we're looking at stuff, especially skin, we see different things that we're trying to look at. We're trying to look at connective tissue. Um, such as collagen, elastin, muscle, basement membrane. You might be wanting to, to investigate deposits such as amyloid, mucin, calcium, iron, melanin. You might want to be finding, you might want to be trying to pull out organisms such as bacteria, mycobacteria, fungi, parasites, and spirochetes. You might want to be trying to pull out nerves and nerve fibers and axons. We very rarely do this in derm with the exception of epidermal nerve fiber density testing, which is kind of beyond the scope of this, um, this talk. But you might want to be looking for fat. Let's say you're trying to determine if it's a sebaceous neoplasm. You might want to do a stain for fat in that case. Or miscellaneous things, you might be trying to bring out mast cells, myeloid cells, et cetera, et cetera. So there are special stains that we can use for all of this. And one that you're going to hear about for connective tissue uh, a lot is Masson's tri trichrome. So we'll go over that a little bit more. But there's some other words you might hear that you don't really need to know are Movats or Gomoris. Um, if you're looking for muscle, some people do a Mallory stain. Reticulin fibers, you can do reticulin stains or Gordon and Sweet. If you're looking for elastin fibers, you can do a Verhoff van Giesen, which is the one you're gonna hear about a lot. You'll see that on your reports. But let's look at the Masson's trichrome. So this is basically has hematoxylin, some other things in it that we won't get into. But it stains nuclei black. It stains cytoplasm, muscle, and RBCs red and collagen blue. So we can differentiate. Basically, we can differentiate muscle from collagen, right? So you could use this as a quick and dirty stain to determine if you're looking at a leiomyoma or not, for instance. So it, it stains collagen blue, which you can see right here, muscle red it'll actually stain fat red. So um, 
here you can see it doing that. But but this is a Masson's trichrome, and here here's an example of an H and E versus a Masson. So with the H and E, you you have um, you know your normal staining, and then with the Masson's here you can see that the connective tissue is staining blue, and some of the epithelial elements are staining red. But I don't see any muscle here. That's what it's telling you. A lot of it. Uh, that's a variation of a trichrome, um, um, but but you can see here that it can be uh, a gomorys can be useful to see elastin fiber. So here, this is a blood vessel wall, and here you're seeing in the, the the elastin fiber right here coming through the the blood vessel wall. So this is actually an arterial. The, if, if you're trying to determine if it's an artery or vein, that's a very good stain. Uh, just just I'm not sure this is very relevant for derm path, but um, in other areas of path, you actually want to see striated muscle and and when you're doing some nerve when you're doing muscle biopsies and whatnot, and you can use what's called a Mallory PTH or PTAH, and you, it stains the cross striations of of uh, skeletal muscle. Just something to think about. Elastin tissue. This is very derm path apropos. Um, elastin is we use most labs use a Verhoff van Giesen. And we often use elastin stain to determine if we're looking at a scar because a scar has decreased or no elastin versus normal, normal dermis where you'll have the elastin network. There's all sorts of uh, elastin containing tumors. There's uh, uh, congenital elastin deficiencies, um, uh, et cetera, that we can use an elastin tissue to stain for. And here's an example of a very fine Giesen. So the elastin stains black basically. And here you can see, here, this is probably a scar right here. I'm not, I'm not certain actually, but, but you can see here that the scars coming down here, there's no elastin fibers. And where there's re residual normal dermis, you can see some elastin fibers right there. So it's oftentimes very useful to determine if you're looking at a scar or, or morphia, say. Um, two other elastin stains are resorption fusion and luna stain luna stain stains at purple instead very few people use these reticulin stain um, you can sometimes use this to look at the reticulin network in the skin but it's not it's not used much but they use these in kidney biopsies and liver biopsies all the time when they're looking at the architecture and, and so you can see here these these different elements they basically stain um, reticulin fibers black uh, Oftentimes in skin, we're looking at mucopolysaccharides. Basically, we're wanting to see if we have an increase in dermal mucin, right? So there's different types of dermal mucin. You've got neutral, which is glycogen and glandular mucin of, of neoplasms. And then you've got your acid non-sulfated, which is also seen in, in um, neoplasms. And then you've got your acid sulfated, which are the chondroitin and keratin sulfates, which are seen in the, uh, the dermis in, in, in like lupus for instance, or sclera So we can use PAS for this, which is going to stain glycoproteins that are neutral. We can use colloidal iron, toluidine blue, and alcyon blue. Um, basically, uh, PAS is a very common stain. It's probably the most common stain that we use in Dermpath. And, and, and um, we do a uh, pre-digestion, which, which we can remove glycogen. So you can do it with or without diastase. And so a PAS is basically what it does is it oxidates carbohydrates to aldehyde, and then you use the Schiff reaction stains aldehyde with red, with fusion sulfuric acid. So basically the periodic acid Schiff reaction. Okay, so we're, we're basically oxidizing carbohydrates to aldehyde, and then we're staining the aldehyde. And here it is. So here's the basement membrane, which is often stains bright red. The glycogen in the middle layers of the epidermis stains. Um, you know, oftentimes blood vessel walls will stain with this. Here's the glycogenation of the epidermis, or you often get this in mucosa, and here it is in a goblet cell in the intestine. And so you'll hear the term PAS with and without diastase. So if you do a PAS with diastase, the diastase is the same enzyme in, in saliva. And, and basically it breaks down glycogen. So if you do it without diastase here on the right, you can see the glycogen of the epidermis or mucosal regions, is, it will stain. And then if you add the diastase before you do the PAS stain, it's gone. 
So it makes it a cleaner stain. And you can also tell if it's glycogen containing or not, if that's useful. Uh, PAS will also stain uh, the fungal walls and cellulose. And so here's a dermatophyte here, and here's some deep fungal infections right there. What if we're looking for, um, if we're looking for increased dermal mucin now? PAS is not good for that. Instead, we use colloidal iron, Hale's colloidal iron. And basically, um, the, this will, the carboxylated and sulfated regions of an acid mucopolysaccharide attract the ferric iron. And then, then you use a Prussian blue reaction to stain the ferric iron. Okay, so that, that's how it works. And in the pearls modification, you add um, acid to it. And basically that, that frees up the iron for staining. So a, a pearls modification will stain for hemosiderin free iron and the Hales colloidal iron is going to stay, is going to use uh, the, the, the sulfated regions of the acid to attract the ferric ion, which we're then going to detect with the, with, with the Prussian blue reaction. So that's a fancy way of showing uh, mucin in, in the dermis. So here's an example of GA. Here's the H and E, and here is the um, the staining with Hales colloidal iron, and you can see GA contains mucin in the center of the palisades. And here's an example of nephrogenic fibrosing dermopathy, which has an increase in mucin, particularly in the, in the early stages of the disease. Uh, here's an example of scleroderma with colloidal iron. So that's an example of a process where you have an increase in in um, interstitial mucin, and there you can see it. Here's H and E up here on the top left, and here is the colloidal iron on the bottom there. And here's pearls, so this is where we add hot acid to it, and basically this is going to stain for free iron, and this is for hemosiderin. So if you're looking at a hemosiderotic dermatofibroma, for instance, you're trying to determine if that's a melanoma or a dermatofibroma, which clinically they look like melanomas, uh, and, and then you're going to histologically get a lot of pigment you can use an iron stain to check for iron. Oftentimes bruises, old bruises will come in as melanoma and we can prove that they're old bruise hemosiderin deposition by, by doing a, a um, iron stain, a pearls iron stain. Okay, we've talked about uh, these. Uh, we are gonna skip past these. So let's go on to uh, staining for um, for melanin and other deposits. So basically, if you want to stain for melanin, the stains are Fontanamasan or you can do a melanin bleach. Okay, so a Fontanamasan is going to stain melanin black. That could easily be on your boards or used on your boards. A melanin bleach you can use if you have tons of, of, of melanin laden macrophages that are obscuring a process such as a regressed melanoma that's left a lot of melanophages, you can actually bleach melanin out so that you can see the neoplasm, okay? Um, if you're looking for calcium, you would want to use a von Casa. That might be on your boards. That would be used, you could use that in um, uh, calciflaxis. If you're looking for small, minute, microscopic calcium deposition, uh, you can use a von Casa. Another one is an alizarin red. For amyloid, Congo red, crystal violet, and thioflavin T are the the things we use, Congo red is the most common. So here we go, let's look at some of these. So Fontanamasan stains melanin black, not necessarily melanocytes. Remember, melanin can be in keratinocytes. It gets dumped into the keratinocytes by the melanocytes, and here we have that process going on. Um, and then here, these are melanocytes actually. See, the, the nucleus is, is red here. It's not staining, but the cytoplasm is loaded with melanin. These are calcium stains now. Um, alizarin red is binding to calcium, looks like calcium in a blood vessel. This could be uh, calciflaxis. And here's a von Casa. Also, it kind of stains it a, a um, dark brown to black. And here it is in a blood vessel wall. This is not probably calciflaxis. This is what's called medial calcific sclerosis. You see this in old, older patients very commonly. But um, so that's, that's a useful stain. Here's amyloid. So amyloid, this is actually the amyloid stain. This is not hematoxin eosin. And here you can see amyloid deposits in the papillary dermis right here. And then when you do a, um, when you do a, 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 um, a 
polarization of it. It's birefringent apple green. What does that mean? It means as you turn the polarization uh, film, you're, you're, you're changing the angles and uh, that the light is allowed to come through and you switch it perpendicular and parallel essentially. And, and you'll see that this is the apple green birefringence right here. And as you turn it, this would turn apple green and this would turn orange. And as you turn it back, the reverse happens. That's the birefringence that they're talking about. So, so you, you skip between apple green and an orangish that'll flip back and forth as you change the polarization um, orientation. And that's what they mean by the birefringent apple green. But actually you can see conga red is, you can see it positive too. So here's negative, this is collagen, and here's positive. It's this, it's this, um, it's this kind of orangey red color. Here's another, um, here, here's another amyloid. Here's deposits of amyloid in a, um, here's that orangey red. This is in a blood vessel. And then when you do the, the birefringence part of it's the orange yellow that goes to the apple green, it'll go back and forth, birefringent. And so that's, that's real amyloid. When you see it in a vessel like that, that is systemic amyloid. And then you need to work it up for, you know, uh, light chains, um, et cetera, all the deposition diseases. What if we're looking for fat? The only, the only time we look for fat in um, derm path would be really looking for um, uh, a sebaceous neoplasm. Okay, so it's not done very often, but you can use oil red O. The problem with this is it can only be done on frozen tissue, so it can't be done on formal and fixed tissue because what does formal and fixed tissue do? It, 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 it kind of removes a lot of the fat out because it's, it's a... Uh, um, and, and, and processing, not just the formula and fixation, but the actual processing. Remember, we're using xylene and alcohols and everything. It basically removes the fat. So when we see adipocytes in processed material, the fat is gone. That's just the, the residual cell walls. So, so here you have to do it on fresh tissue. So you basically have to have um, fresh tissue sent in. So it's not done very often, but that's what it looks like. You might see it on your boards and they might ask a stain for fat. It's oil red oil. What else might we be looking for? We might be looking for mast cells and mast cell disease. And so you can use what's called a von Leder stain. You can use Gimsa, or you can use methylene and toluidine blue. Uh, the most common are Gimsa and von Leder, although now most people do it with immunostain CD117. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But here, here's what mast cells look like with toluidine blue. They are kind of purplish, okay? And here's on Von Leder, they're red, they're bright red. All right, so they might throw, here's a Von Leder stain on the, on the boards and you see these, you gotta know that's mast cells. Gimsa uh, stains mast cells purple. They're purple granular, okay. So here, here, are, the, here are the mast cells right here with Gimsa stain. Organisms we might look for are fungi. We use PAS with or without diastase, like I said. Grocots, meth methanamine silver, so GMS stain. You're going to hear that very frequently in your career and in training. Or you can use mucicarmine, which will pick up cryptococcus. Uh, mucicarmine stains from mucin for the most part. Bacteria, we use a gram stain, or you'll hear the term brown and bren, which is a modified gram stain. So a gram stain is basically crystal violet and iodine, okay? And then if you add on a basic fusion, now it's called a brown and bren. So you're gonna hear some labs, they'll say, oh, I did a brown and bren stain and it was positive for gram positive organisms. So don't get confused, it's basically a gram stain. And some bacteria show up with Gimsa. So here's a PAS stain. So there are here, this is actually H&E. You can see that here, and then when you do the PAS, this is Canada, you get your spaghetti and, and meatballs, although some people use that for, um, for pterosperm, but spaghetti meatballs, but there you have fungi. Here's GMS. GMS stains fungi dark brown or it's black. It's a silver stain. So, you know, here's blasto. And you can actually use PAS for, for dermatophytosis. I, actually, it's a better stain, I think. It's easier to read, but PAS is much cheaper to do. So, so here's a PAS versus a, a GMS right here. Um, here's uh, 
crypto with mucicarmine. Here's an alcyon, or here's here's crypto with alcyon blue and PAS. Uh, you know, so basically you're doing a PAS stain with an alcyon blue on top of it. You know, people get all fancy with these. You can do GMS. Here's the GMS, and here's the mucicarmine. So there's all sorts of ways you can bring these out. Spirochetes and AFE. So spirochetes you stain. So syphilis. Um, Lyme disease, et cetera, you stain using uh, silver stains. So these are Dieterle and Steiner stain or Worthen Starry stain. For acid fast bacilli, I use Phyte, AFB, Kenyans, AFB, Oramine, Rhodamine, Immunofluorescence. So you can actually use a fluorescent stain for these, which is very sensitive. But very few labs do this, but it's extremely sensitive for them. So here's an example of, of uh, spirochetes in, 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 um, in tissue right here. This is what they look like with a silver stain, All right? So Lyme disease, syphilis would look like this. And with AFB, they stain the AFB very bright pink. So here they are. These are macrophages loaded with acid fast bacilli. Um, um, so then you, you can also do nocardia and actinomyces, some of these with these um, modified kidneys. So there's just all these different methods, but basically AFB stain red. Um, so here's the gram stain. So the brown, brown and brands or the brown hops sometimes. That's the thing. These things have many different names, but brown and brand, brown hops. If you hear the term brown, it's almost likely a, um, a gram stain. And so it's crystal violet and iodine, like I said. So gram positives are blue which you can see here, gram negatives are red, which you can see here. All right, so that's some good examples of some uh, special stains. So what about immunostochemistry? So immunostochemistry can be either immunofluorescent, so you're detecting antibody, you're detecting antigens using antibodies, all right? So we can do that with immunofluorescence detection, or we can do it with a colorimetric detection that we can look at under the microscope. Let's talk about direct immunofluorescence right now. Basically, we can use immunofluorescent labeled antibodies against antigens in tissue. If we do it directly, we use the patient's tissue, that's called direct immunofluorescence. If we use the patient's sera against like monkey esophagus or something like that, that's indirect. We're gonna talk about direct. So basically you've got the tissue section which has an antigen on it and you've got a fluoroclone labeled antibody, okay? That's direct immunofluorescence. Now you can increase the sensitivity, harken back to your medical school days by doing the sandwich technique. So if you have an antibody to an antibody, that, that increases the leverage, if you will, and increases the sensitivity um, multiple fold. And so that's what most of, most of the processes use in unlabeled antibody. So you've got that tissue section with the antigen, an unlabeled antibody, and then an antibody to the portion of this antibody, usually the FC portion, labeled with, um, or the, yeah, the anti-IgG labeled with a fluorochrome, and then you can look at it. So how does this done? Conventional microscopy, the light comes up from the bottom and goes through the tissue, right? That's how it works. So the light source is right here, and it goes up and then into the eyes. In immunofluorescence, it's the opposite. The light comes from the top down onto the tissue fluoresces and makes it fluoresce and then and then the then the fluorescence gets transmitted back up to the eye. So this is actually my scope at my desk, which is just right here on my left. But but um so the the you've got an exciter light over here that's going to immuno that's going to excite the atoms and cause them to autofluoresce and come up the eyepiece. How do we do it? It can't be done on uh, formalin fixed tissue. The formalin kind of destroys the antigens a little bit. And also um, this has to be done on fresh frozen tissue. So we basically use the Michelle's, fix, Michelle's preservative, like I said, it comes in and then we freeze it a frozen, just kind of like they do Mohs, all right? So we, we take the tissue and we put it into OCT, um, which, is a, which is a gel and then it's rapidly frozen to minus 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. And basically this, and this is the process. So it's done, basically the microtome is in, 
Here it's negative 25 degrees Celsius, you can see. And basically here's the tissue in the OCT. And then, we, and then you cut it really thin, you put it on a slide, and then you do the, do the antibody sandwich, okay? And then you're done. All right, so here's where the board stuff. We're gonna talk about, you, you hear about direct reinforcements and salt splitting to tell the difference between epidermal lysis, bullosa acquisita, and bullous pemphigoid. Well, what is salt splitting? It's very simple. From a laboratory perspective, we basically take the tissue, remember it's fresh, or, or it was frozen, but we thought we put it in one molar sodium chloride. That's it, table salt, one molar overnight. You come back the next morning, you look to see if there was a split between the epidermis and dermis. If not, put it back in for another night. If it did split, then you just perform the immunofluorescence again. So in the intact skin, you have a linear band that's positive right here. After you've done your salt split, if it's on the roof, it's bullous pemphigoid. And if it's on the floor, it's EBA. And this is because the salt split actually splits it at the lamina lucida, depending, and depending on the different antigens, which you all will know for your boards, I know, um, the bullous pemphigoid sticks to the roof and EBA sticks to the base, all right? So here's an example. Here is EBA after the salt split. So here's the epidermis. This is through the immunofluorescent scope, okay? And here's the dermis. Here's the positive band and here's the split that was caused by the sodium chloride. And you can see it's on the floor. So that's consistent with EBA. Now, do many labs do salt splits anymore? They don't, all right? Because they're, when they work, they're great, but they don't normally, they don't work sometimes and get half of it split. And then it's both on the roof and the floor and you just can't interpret it. It's, it's not clean very often, let's put it that way. So what, what is some of the newer stuff in the literature? Well inserration and eucerration patterns. So not splitting it. So we're not doing the salt split. If we throw on IgA, or excuse me, if we throw on IgG or C3 and we have a linear band like this, we know we're dealing with either bullous pemphigoid or epidermolysis bullosa acquisitive. But if you go to super high power, inserration pattern, so see, these are a bunch of N's. See that N right there? N, 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 N. That's why they call it inseration. And basically it means that the points are down, okay? Like an N, they're down. That is bullous pemphigoid. If it's a U-serration pattern, meaning the points are up, here's the U, here's the U, here's the U, here's the U, that is EBA. And they're saying this is better test and more specific than salt splitting, okay? It, it works better. Um, so that may end up on the boards eventually um, more, sooner than later. So inseration pattern in your linear band is, is bullous pemphigoid. Eucerration pattern in your linear band is EBA, all right? I told you I'd promise you some boards. What is the optimal biopsy for direct pneumofluorescence? If you send in a punch through the blister itself, I have fibrin there, I have neutrophils, lymphocytes, the patient scratched it, there's junk, it's impetigenized, everything just fluoresces. Okay, you get false positives and false negatives. It doesn't work. What you want is perilesional skin from a recent untreated lesion, all right? So basically, you take it, immediately to the side of the blister in a new lesion that hasn't been treated and 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 you're looking for that that that's the sweet spot it's okay to get the blister right at the edge of the biopsy but and that sometimes is a little helpful but um that that's what you want for the dif all right just so so you all can get your eyes accustomed to seeing some of these here's 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 some examples here's the epidermis epidermis, dermis. Here's the dermoepidermal junction, and we have a strong linear band. This happened to be IgG. This was bullous pemphigoid. And actually, C3 is usually stronger than IgG in bullous pemphigoid. All right, so that's a little pearl. And oftentimes in EBA, IgG is stronger than C3. So, and then here's another pattern. Here's a granular pattern. So see how this is linear? This is granular. And this would be derm dermatitis or pediformis. Here we have granular deposits in the papillary dermis. So here's the epidermis. Here's the dermis. Epidermis, um, 
is a little strange on direct inflorescence because the nuclei are dark brown, or excuse me, black, they don't stain. So you have holes where the nuclei are, you just have to get used to that. And the cytoplasm picks up nonspecific staining. So that's how you know you, this is epidermis and this is dermis and there's the granular, you know, granular IgA at the tips of dermal papillae, classic for dermatitis or pediformis. So in immunofluorescence, we're, we're using immunofluorescent label antibodies. So they have a tag on them that, that fluoresces when, when you hit it with the proper wavelength of light. In, in immunostaining, uh, immunoperoxidase staining, instead of using light to detect it, we're using a, a, a antibodies linked to an enzyme that produces a color reaction, okay? And we can make that color brown, using diaminobenzidine, so DAB. So you can either order stains with a DAB brown detection or you can order it with a red detection. And this is the amino ethyl carbazole, AEC red detection. Okay, so what does, that, what does that mean? So essentially, remember we have our fixed tissue. Now we don't need to use fresh tissue. Now we can use fixed tissue, so paraffin embedded, Fixed tissue has been processed, can been sitting around for years sometimes and it still works. You have your primary antibody to the, to the um, antigen that we're trying to detect, the second sandwich, and then we have this enzyme linked to the antibody on one end, and then we have a substrate that the antibody works on to create a colored project, product. And we can either use DAB brown right here or red, all right? And how do we do it? These used to be done by hand with pressure cookers and literally the stuff you use in your kitchen, the pressure cookers, but now we do them on these um, auto stainers and they're, they have robotic arms and they're really nice. Um, um, but these are what the machines look like. Uh, different ones that we use, we can have melanocytic markers. Um, various ones we use are S100. This is a red detection, right? Clearly red, S100. We can use MART1 red detection. Other melanocytic markers are HMB45, SOX10, MIT-F, once used. So this is a melanoma right here, S100 positive, MART positive. Cytokeratins, we can detect um, carcinomas with cytokeratins, various ones. You'll hear AE1, AE3, pan-cytokeratin. You can put these as cocktails so we can put them all together. We can put both AE1 and AE3 together. Um, CAM 5.2 is a low molecular weight. Um, uh, cytokeratin 903 is a high molecular weight. You'll often hear when we have a metastatic tumor of unknown origin, we're trying to differentiate it. We can use cytokeratin 7 and 20 to tell different patterns, you know, just statistically. Um, we just talked about that. So here's what these look like. So here's an example of something. We'll go through it. So we have a neoplasm here. It's intraepidermal, nesting, single pagetoid cells. This could be melanoma or this could be a carcinoma, all right? So what do we do? We throw cytokeratin on it and lo and behold, the cells are positive. See, these single cells here are positive. So that means we're dealing with a carcinoma instead of a melanoma. Pancytokeratin is often what we use. Now the question is, are we dealing with squamous cell carcinoma in situ or are we dealing with Paget's disease, which is an adenocarcinoma in situ, right? So then we can use CEA. This is a very common marker for for adenocarcinomas, all right? And so we throw on CEA and lo and behold, they're positive, all right? And we can even use PAS, which will stain the mucin in these cells because they're adenocarcinoma and they're positive. So if you have something that looks like a melanoma inside you that's cytokeratin AE1, AE3 positive, CEA positive, and PAS mucin positive, that's Paget's disease, all right? Either mammary or extra mammary. Mammary is just breast carcinoma coming up the breast duct and going up under the surface epidermis. So it's a breast adenocarcinoma. Extra mammary are also adenocarcinomas. Oftentimes they're apocrine carcinomas of the axilla or, or the pubic region or even sebaceous carcinoma in situ that, that have come up the ducts and they're going up under the surface epidermis. Uh, just some lymphoid markers uh, and we're gonna wrap this up pretty soon. Uh, we've got, you know, different T cell markers, our CD3, 4, 5, 7, 45 RO, B cell or CD20. So T cell CD3, B cell CD20, know that. 4, 
five, um, eight is also a T cell. Um, uh, activated B and T cells, so ones that are actively mitotic or, or, or revved up or CD30 positive. Mast cells are CD117 positive. We use that instead of the leader stain now. Blasts are often CD117 or CD34 positive. Myelocytic things are myeloperoxidase positive. You'll hear that MPO positive. Macrophages are CD68 and 4. So how do we use this? Here we have a neoplasm with N vessels, all right? And the question is, are we dealing with a metastatic carcinoma? Are we dealing with uh, a T cell lymphoma? Are we dealing with a leukemia? Are we dealing with an intravascular B cell lymphoma? So what, what do we do? We throw on our markers. Three, we put on three and four and they're mostly negative, all right? We put on 20 and they're blazing positive. Look at that, stuffed with CD20. So that's a B cell marker. That's how we use it. That's an intravascular B cell lymphoma, okay? Uh, we could do a myeloid sarcoma, so a, a leukemia, a myeloid leukemia presenting in the skin as a sarcoma is often called a chloroma, and that's myeloperoxidase. And here is what it looks like, these nondescript cells here, and we throw on an MPO and it's positive. It's a leukemia. Langerhans cell histiocytosis, we use uh, uh, various stains for Langerhans cells, which are they're CD1A and S100 positive. And Langerin, very few people use this, but but the, 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 this is actually normal skin. That's normal Langerhans cells, so antigen-presenting cells within the epidermis. And then here's another classic one. Um, immunohistochemistry is used for a Merkel cell carcinoma, so cytokeratin 20, perinuclear, so here's the nuclei, dot-like positive, all right? This definitely is going to be on your boards at some point. So here's the nucleus. Here's a perinuclear dot. See that? That's the perinuclear dot-like positivity cytokeratin-20 of a Merkel cell carcinoma. And actually, synaptophysin and chromogranin will also show a very similar pattern. When you see that perinuclear dot positivity, think Merkel cell, all right? And with that, I think uh, our hour is about up and, and uh, my slides are done. So I think, I think you can see how we use the laboratory and how we need the proper specimens and fixatives and whatnot to do different things that, that we that we use to get arrive at a specific diagnosis. So if you all have any questions or anything, I, I see, I think, I'm not sure if you all can chime in or not. I'm not sure how to make, get it to where you can chime in. But um, if you all have any questions, you can feel free to email us and, and we'll get back to you on it. And um, um, I, I appreciate you all spending the time with me today. Okay.